selective relaxation or selective exemptions are not possible. You have to consistently apply. But low value exemption for low value underlying asset exemption for leases, in such case you can go on case to case basis. Certain leases you can take an exemption. Certain leases you can start recognizing them even though they consider to be of low value. Clear? Now that we understood, we are just talking about what are the inclusions and exclusions in scope. We haven't gone too much. We have just done exclusions from the scope of the standing and we have just done exemptions from recognition. That's it. We haven't done much far about it from there. Now comes in the question. Is the standard so different? Sir, I'm going to live. What level am I going to stream? Live or what? Look, sir, show me. Ah, in the cool cool, sir. No, it's cool. Yeah, that's what it is. No, sir, I'm going to have to go off. Yeah, I think we are live. I think we're still live. Check it out, sir. Yeah, close it. Live finish on it. What is it? Live finish on it. Are they in the close end? In the close end, are they not like you? Should be running, right? Okay. Oh, that's not the correct one. Play it, right? Power interruption, I think. Stream is still running. Stream is the problem in that. 
సార్ మీకు ఎనీ ఎనీ డేస్ ఇవ్వనా మీకు ఒకసారి ఒకసారి ఎనీ డేస్ ఇవ్వమంటారా రాసుకోండి స్ట్రీమ్ డెస్క్కి I think we went offline guys for some reason I have no idea what was the reason I'm really sorry about that I don't know why it went offline and I can't even see your comments as well it still says live stream is offline Just give me a second I think we are back live. I think I can see. Yeah, I think we are going. Uh, just let me know if there is any other trouble that you are getting because I, I see that the stream is already live. I was just checking if the video is live or not. I think it is live. Yeah, Krishna Garu, I think it is live. Yeah, Sadhguru. Okay, sir. A small technical glitch and nothing else. Uh, There's a small technical glitch and nothing else. So, let's go on. So, if you observe, guys, so what we were talking about, let me see where we are basically when we are talking about this scheme of things Yes, guys, I can see your comments as well. No problem. So we were talking about exemptions. So now let's discuss about why is this standard coming up and how is it so different from our India 17. When India 17 was implemented, when it was handling it well, like I told you, India 116 is a development account. It'll start giving you a new dimension only to the concept of operating leases. Whatever we had in finance lease will stay as it is. And more importantly, let me tell you, if I compare between India 17 and if I go on comparison with your India 116, I'll basically split them into four parts, okay? One is operating lease, and the other one is finance lease. These are the only two leases that we had. Even now, also, we have only two leases. And of which we did talk about lessor and lessee's accounting. Even here also we did discuss about under finance lease, lessor and lessee's account. 
under index 116 if i am talking about the comparison i would still have the same accounting treatment whatever i had for finance lease there's no change and even for operating lease to the extent of lessor i will preserve my treatment the only place i am going to make a change is lessee account this is the only difference which comes up where the difference we'll talk about something called as rou sx the remaining things are absolutely the same the entire books of lessor books of lessor same lessee's accounting for finance lease lessee's accounting for finance lease same the only difference which is coming up is lessee's accounting for operating lease under india 17 and 116 balance sheet being done on 31st march 2020 we will start looking at what is this right of use assets this right of use assets will emerge out of nowhere and will start making some sense now because right on the face of the balance sheet you will find rou assets rou machinery rou furniture which is distinct from the assets which i own but they are still assets what i own is basically presented under property plan and equipment rou assets are also presented under property plan and equipment but as a distinct specific item that is basically the only logic that i'm going to discuss as far as the standard is concerned so throughout the standard keep your head very very clear that now whatever india is 116 i'm learning the only different part other than what i had in as 19 your as 19 or your india is 117 both were basically the same there is no great difference between both of them as far as their recognition is concerned so lessor accounting treatment i am not going to see any difference lessee's accounting treatment under finance lease i am not going to see any difference but lessee's accounting under operating lease i will start looking at a new word called as right of use assets now let's start discussing that now first of all the first thing that i have to do is i'll have to identify a lease first of all what is a non what is a lease a contract is or a contract contains a lease only if it transfers a right to control the use of the asset to the lessee in exchange for consideration i said a contract is a lease or contains a lease if it conveys right to control the use of asset right to control the use of asset to the lessee in exchange for what do you exchange for nothing but consideration that is nothing but your periodic lease rentals so i am looking at this when do i say i control the use of this i control the use of identifiable asset now identification of lease you are again talking about identification of controlling the asset now let's start looking at it. yes guys so when we are talking about identifying the lease so basically a lease a contract contains a lease if it conveys a right to control the use of an asset 
for a period of time in exchange for consideration. Now, first of all, what are the necessary components of a lease? So, when do I say a contract contains a lease and what are the necessary criteria for it? The first criteria is there should be an identifiable asset. Without an identifiable asset, you can never call it as a lease. Criteria number one, identifiable asset. When do you call something as an identifiable asset? Are all assets identifiable? I'll come to that once. Relax. Number two. Second thing is the customer or in lease terms we call them as lessee has a right to obtain has a right to obtain substantial all the economic benefits from use of a set. throughout the period clear number three the customer or the lessee has a right to direct how and what purpose the asset is being used. These are the three parts. First one, you identify the asset. There should be an identifiable asset to call it as a lease. Number two, the lessee or the customer, whoever is taking the lease, uh, asset or lease, has a right to obtain substantially all the economic benefits which are arising from the use of the asset throughout the period of the lease. The customer or the lessee has a right to direct, I have a right to direct, on how the asset will be used and for what purpose the asset will be used. If these three conditions are satisfied, you can definitely say that that contract does contain a lease. Now sometimes there happens to be a situation. I'll bring in the concept of Appendix B which we had earlier under India 70. Yes, I did say that it is not relevant for you to remember, but I'm just bringing up arrangements which can contain a lease. I was doing Indays for a particular power manufacturing company in Hyderabad which was into supplying windmills. Their logic is very simple. They manufacture or construct a windmill. They erect it directly at the customer's premises. So let's say there is Tata Power. Uh, the Tata has, uh, sorry, uh, let's say Tata Steel is there. So Tata Steel has a particular manufacturing plant. I'm taking for an example. So my windmill, which I manufacture in my godown, I will directly go and install it in Tata Steel's premises. And I have an agreement to say that as long as the windmill is erected in your place, let's say the agreement is for 15 years, throughout the period of 15 years, the amount of electricity which is generated by such windmill which is established or erected in your godown, the entire power generated will be only supplied to Tata Steel. I will not have a right to supply it to anyone else. 
there ends the matter. Now, if such is an arrangement, and let's say Tata Steel says, fine then, whatever power is being generated, I will make sure that I will compensate you by paying 15 rupees per unit of power produced. Now you tell me, did I sell power or does it have anything called as lease? Very, very fantastic question. Very fantastic question. Because by the base of the document, if I look at or if, the, if I look at the invoice which this company raises, it says so and so number of units of power supplied multiplied by rate per unit, total value of invoice and they'll give it to the customer. If I look at the face of the invoice, there is nothing for me to believe that there is a lease in it. But if I read the agreement carefully, there I understand this arrangement is in a situation where it is the customer who has a right to use the asset. No one else has a right to use the asset. The windmill is generating power, that power will be consumed by Tata Steel, no one else. It is erected in his premises only. The asset is identifiable. I can see it right in front of me. Such cases, though the arrangement does not look to be having a lease, neither it terms anywhere that it is a lease, but still it contains a lease. It is a lease of the equipment where substantially all the benefits, all the economic benefits which are generated from the use of the windmill are being consumed by the lessee or the customer. Therefore, it 100% contains lease. That's why I said the appendix A, B, C, which was earlier given as an annexure to India 17, are now included as a part of the standard itself. Clear? Now, there are things or certain exemptions when we talk about right to direct how to use. So this is basically right to control the use of the asset. Right to find assets in contract. What is an identified asset in a contract and how do I identify an asset in a contract? Very when the supplier has no substantial substitution right when the supplier has no substantial substitution rights then you can say that the asset is identified in a contract such asset can either be expressed in a contract or can be implied in a contract Sometimes I can say that this is the asset in the contract itself. Sometimes the contract may not identify the asset expressly. But it is implying that there is this is the asset which I am directing or indicating towards. So I can identify the asset. Now for me to identify the asset in a contract, the supplier should never have the supplier's name. We can also give them another name. It is nothing but my lessor. My lessor or the supplier does not have a substantial substitution right now what do you mean by the substantial substitution right and where does this come from now the substantial substitution right means the supplier or the lessor cannot replace the asset with another asset it is not possible for the supplier to basically replace the asset with another asset then we have we say that the supplier or the lessor does not have a substantial substitution right second thing along with that the supplier will not be benefiting economically if he undergoes a substitution i'll put i'll put it up if i write it it makes more sense there are two points here the supplier's substitution right is substantive
substitution right is substantive when is it substantive it is substantive if point number one first point The supplier has a practical ability to substitute alternative asset alternative asset and I am again very clearly separating it with the word and second point supplier would economically benefit from exercise of substitution right. Okay, so I am saying that the supplier should not have a substantial substitution right. What is a substantial substitution right? Supplier has a substantial substitution right if they, he has a practical ability to substitute another asset. For example, the same example which I have given you, the power manufacturing company has set up or erected a windmill plant in the premises of Tata Steel. Tata Steel never specified this. I never said this particular windmill, which I see right in front of me, this is the asset which I wanted to view. I never said. I said you erect any windmill out here, no problem. That power, whatever it produces, I will consume. If I said so, then I am saying that the supplier has a right to remove that windmill, to replace it with one more windmill and keep using it for the same purpose and still the lease contract or the contract which contains a lease is being satisfied along with it and I said and I said I said such substitution such decommissioning of the existing one and replacing it with an alternative asset is economically beneficial to the supplier what does it mean now now it makes a lot of sense most of the companies may not specify the asset in the contract. They may not. They might not really say that this asset with, uh, you know, I might say, I want a lease of a vehicle man. Okay. And what vehicle, sir? I want a lease of a particular Tata Indica. Okay. I want a lease of Tata Indica is what I said. Okay. It has been already used for my purpose. Now, in the contract, I never said, I am implying towards or expressing towards a Tata Indica which has a number plate of 440, 4404. I never said that. I never really expressly talk about what is the vehicle. That means one day the supplier can give me one vehicle, next day he can give me a different vehicle as long as it is Tata Indica, as simple as that. Then I will say the supplier has a substantial substitution rate. But now the question comes in. By substituting that particular vehicle, by substituting that particular asset, by exercising the substitution right, does the supplier get any economic benefit? If your answer is no, sir, if I send this indica also same thing or that indica also same thing, I have 50 indicas. If I send any of them, it is not going to make any economic benefit to me. I basically send the vehicle upon its availability. 
whatever is available i'll ask him to take that particular way there is no economic benefit which i am deriving by exercising the substitution right by sending this particular innova instead of sending that innova did i get a benefit and i did not get a benefit then there is no point of saying that the substitution right is substantive clear sometimes there is no practical ability only man now like the case which i have given you regarding the windmill man 15 years lease rule and windmill is not a small structure okay each blade of windmill is being being taken on each trailer each blade so imagine how big a windmill is now that windmill if i have to substitute with one more windmill think about the transportation cost which i will involve it is absolutely unnecessary why would someone spend so much of money therefore such kind of substitution rights are not substantive if they are not substantive then i can identify the asset in the contract as simple as that now just keep looking into it i'll start